All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it was such an interesting first session. I hope everyone agrees and you could have uh, interesting discussions over the break. Um, so the, the, this second session is more about the technical aspect. Uh, so I'll start by uh, discussing how we can estimate the carbon footprint of, of computing in practice and, and more the technical side of things. Um, then you'll hear from uh, Miranda McFarlane about the UKI Net Zero uh, DRI initiative uh, you heard a bit about before. Then we'll have Nick Sata, who will uh, look at the neuroscience pipeline and, and how uh, that's a really interesting case study on how to dive into one field and, and improve uh, the carbon footprint. And then you'll finish with uh, uh, Lincoln Colling, who will talk about best practice in computing and how to make computing a little bit more efficient. Um, all right, just keeping track of time. All right, so uh, you'll notice the background are the, the same stripes everyone uses. I just thought I would put some context into here. Uh, it doesn't matter if you don't do biology. Uh, GWAS uh, is genome-wide association study. Anytime you read a paper that says, uh, we found the gene for X, that's probably what happened. And you know, the, running it on, on a thousand different traits, we get a carbon footprint of around 17 tons. Uh, for context, I could fly to Paris for breakfast and back every morning for six months uh, for that kind of footprint. Uh, but the interest of this slide is also to show that not everything has such a massive carbon footprint. And it's very much, it depends on the analysis. Some analysis and some project will have big, big impact and some not. So I don't want to make people paranoid about overthinking every single keystroke, but the fact that some analysis have these big numbers means we need to think about it. Uh, for example, if we look at uh, AlphaFold and, and having tools where we can estimate carbon footprint, so that's very rough estimation, is around four tons to train the AlphaFold model. Uh, and but AlphaFold is not the only one doing protein folding. There is like this competitor uh, from Facebook, ESM Fold, uh, which is a slightly bigger model, uh, which took 100 tons to, of CO2 equivalent to train it. So really, we can very easily reach hundreds of tons of uh, CO2 equivalent uh, when we start talking about large, uh, large models in, in computing. And, and we touched a little bit about it, is that computing is not free, and we have all this big impact uh, from carbon footprint. But especially in academia, from a user point of view, sometimes there is no cost and it doesn't look like there's a cost. So that's the whole point and, and many people have brought that uh, up earlier, which is that we need to integrate uh, environmental cost as well. All right, so for today, we're going to focus on intense computation. So I'm not going to talk about Zoom and, uh, you know, uh, uh, watching Netflix, but very much like uh, scientific computing. And, and just, it doesn't really matter how you do your computer, how your institution do your compute. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you're using a big gaming computer or virtual machines or HPC. So high performance computing, the same principle applies. Um, so there, we can think about three main aspects of the environmental impact of computing. Uh, the first one is life cycle footprint, and that's related to the scope three uh, Gabby mentioned earlier. For consumer devices, that's your phone, your tablet, your computer, your laptop. 70 to 90% of that total footprint is only from manufacturing. So for these devices, the most important thing we can do is just keep them longer to save that from, from happening again. Uh, in data centers, it's a bit different because they get used a lot more and, and we touched a little bit uh, on that earlier. Uh, the share of, of, computing is, of manufacturing is a bit lower. Uh, it doesn't mean they're cheaper to manufacture, but just they get used more. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we touch about electronic waste. Uh, that's the depressing slide of the day, but there's this World Health Organization report about uh, finding that 80% 80, 80 of the 50 million tons of electronic waste are handled by up to 50 million, uh, what they call informal waste workers. Basically, that means dump sites, uh, including children, and, and you can imagine the health consequences. So that just shows, again, the importance of keeping hardware, uh, keeping hardware for longer. And that's obviously not going to go down anytime soon. Then we move to data storage. Uh, if we look at the average data center, uh, only half the power we provide to the data center is actually used for uh, the computers. 10% is used for storage and 50% uh, and 40 the remaining 40% is mostly to keep the data center nice and cool. So that, that shows the importance of data storage and having proper data storing uh, pipelines, which is not only making enough backup, that's obviously very important, but also when to delete data. And that's usually a critical piece that's missing from any kind of data management plan uh, 
data doesn't get deleted because it's cheap to buy a new hard drive, uh, but you still need to power it, and there's obviously the embodied emission. Uh, 10 kilograms is, the, is a rough estimate. It's the order of magnitude. It's not an exact value. It depends on the exact hardware, but 10 kilograms per terabyte of data per year is roughly the, um, the, the, uh, the annual footprint of storing data. And then we get to powering the computer, which is only looking at electricity usage during a task. And that's something that's interesting to individual scientists because that's the user side. Um, and that's actually not very hard to do. Uh, you just need to know how much energy you need uh, or how much energy is, need, is used, which is, depends on the software and the hardware. Uh, and then how much, what's the carbon footprint of producing that electricity? And that's called carbon intensity. And that mostly depends on where you are in the world because most data centers are plugged to the uh, local power grid. Uh, so, uh, just a little bit of math, but that's the only slide. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in that aspect, it's just to show that it's not very hard to estimate. You, it depends on how long the model runs for, how much power is being drawn, and that depends on the processing cores and memory, and then the efficiency of the data center, which is a way to quantify uh, the overheads of the data center. So that's, that's a way to make things more efficient. Uh, I'm happy to discuss that further, or we got our green algorithm paper where we dive into why we include some aspects. Carbon intensity, uh, that's where we have great discrepancies between countries or I just, you know, you, you take two different countries doing exactly the same task with exactly the same hardware and you have completely different uh, carbon footprints just because of the source of electricity. If you're interested in real time value, uh, electricity map is really interesting. You can look at a country in real time and you see where the electricity is being imported from. Um, and we're here in the UK, so we have this uh, carbon intensity app, which is also quite interesting, but also if you look at the map, you can see that it's not only per country, but also per region in the UK, the carbon footprint of electricity is quite different depending on, on times of day. Uh, and, and many people have touched about that and that's part of the discussion. The point is not to say, oh, we, you know, it has a carbon footprint, we can't do science anymore, uh, just that we have to be mindful. And sometimes, as pointed out earlier, um, best practice for sustainability also happen to be best practices for, uh, for science in general. So that's, that led us to, to come up with these greener principles where we try to bring together many stakeholders. So, well, AGR UK, they're just on the other side of the hall. Sorry about that. Um, and and uh, Talia and Alex contributed to that as well. And the idea was to come up with a set of principles. Because it's science, a big part of the work was to find something that matches the greener principles uh, acronym. Uh, and so I'm just going to run through that uh, quickly. Governance is responsibility, no need to spend time on that. Uh, it's been discussed this morning a lot, uh, who is in charge, and, and the answer was everyone. But focusing on the, on the practice, how to estimate it. So that was the theory. Now is how do we do it in practice? And so if you're interested, we've got this short primer that we put together with, Ma with Michael Inouye that kind of runs through the different options and the pros and cons. So if, you, if you're a, a computational scientist, that might be of interest. But there are, some, there are a lot of tools available, uh, usually uh, as packages that you put in your code and they basically track what you're doing as you're doing it. Uh, they work really well. Uh, if you have good eyes, you'll notice that most of them are in Python. So they work really well if you're doing science in Python, preferably if you're doing machine learning in Python. Uh, if you start to deviate from that, uh, sometimes the, the tools are just not quite as available. Uh, and that's what motivated the Green Algorithms calculator we, uh, we put together, uh, which is, uh, an online calculator where you just say, I'm using my res the resources for that long, this is why I'm in the world, it doesn't matter which fields of science, it doesn't mat matter what hardware you're using, uh, and the calculator comes up with uh, estimates of carbon footprints as a way to raise awareness, and it's all open source on GitHub, and that's been uh, a resource that's, been, that's quite widely used now, so that's been good to see. Uh, the problem of the, of the tools like that is that you... It doesn't work if you run a lot of different tasks. So it doesn't work at institutional level. It's very much for a small project or for, for example, a grant application. Uh, so we thought it would be great if we could include that in HPC facilities. Um, and so, and so we, we did that. We called that green algorithm for HPC because most of the HPC work gets logged on the data center because they need usually to charge you or to at least know who is using what. Uh, and so if you use all the logs, you can then uh, calculate carbon footprints. Uh, and so this server-side tool, uh, also, also on GitHub, uh, has been quite interesting. It gives you a lot more precise metrics, including some I wish I didn't know, like the impact of failed jobs, for example. But we go back to like behavioral change and the importance of having information. Now, the problem of that is it's not very pretty, uh, you know, and it's on the terminal, and, and so it's not great. So, but that enables, for example, to deep dive into particular fields. So we did it for bioinformatics 
or, and, and that jumps what uh, funding bodies, so uh, sorry for the slides in French, but that's the uh, French Mini uh, Department of the Environment, and they have, you know, they have funding calls, and one of their funding calls is for AI projects for local communities. This is a 40 million euro funding call, so quite a big one, um, and they required, so they made it compulsory, and that jumps to what we uh, were talking about this morning. They made it compulsory for all the applications to include estimates of the carbon footprint of the AI models, uh, and they went further than that. They actually made it compulsory for all of them to use our online calculator uh, because they decided they were happy with the methodology and to make it comparable again. Uh, so that's a really interesting case study where, you know, they just decided to do it, and they did it, and it seems to be going well. Uh, people still apply. It didn't break science. Uh, this, you know, it, it still works. Uh, and, and a good use case of, of making models open uh, and estimation tools open. So the idea to, would be to build on these uh, server tools, to build a dashboard that would be a little bit more interesting. Uh, and so, uh, well, we've got um, Alex and Matthias here who built this one at EBI. Uh, and and that's, that's the great example of how to implement carbon footprint dashboard. And, and we talked about that earlier, to feed back to users what is their computing usage and what is the impact and the environmental impact on that. Uh, so, that, you know, that, that can show if, um, the impact, the carbon footprint of different teams uh, or the impact of failed jobs. We go back to uh, encouraging scientific best practices uh, or memory of allocation, for example. So that's a great thing. So we thought, well, maybe we can combine all that together and we've got a back end that works for slum clusters. It doesn't matter if that doesn't ring a bell, but that's an open source workload manager that's now being used widely by, by most institutions. And there's this wonderful dashboard. So how we merge them all together um, and that's, that's what we are uh, putting together now and ho hoping to release uh, very soon. So if you're interested in piloting this kind of uh, dashboard, please do get in touch uh, for your institutions and we can see how to do it. Uh, hopefully that's going to be uh, in the next few weeks uh, to make it available both at individual level for users, but also institutions can have an overview of the entire carbon footprint of, of users on this facility. Um, and other things uh, for biologists in the room, uh, next floor, well, it's not only for biologists, but mostly biologists use it, uh, which is a pipeline manager. Uh, it's just a way to automate uh, computing pipelines, and uh, they now have a plugin uh, to estimate carbon footprints, which is doing exactly the same thing as our online calculator. They basically just implemented, so we, we help them out with that. Uh, that's really good to see this kind of implementation to, again, to feedback information to users, uh, or if you're interested in deep learning this, this guide. Uh, the importance of transparency, uh, that's one thing we've started to do, is to uh, include the carbon footprint our paper, of our papers uh, at the end of our publication, just acknowledge the carbon footprint of the work. Uh, you'll notice we, we, back in the day, sometimes uh, we included offsetting, we don't anymore. Uh, but it's been, really good to, uh, it's been really good to see more and more people picking it up as a way just to raise awareness and just acknowledge the same way you, you have ethical statements in, in medical papers. Uh, and now reducing, I'll go very quickly. If you're interested on these 10 simple rules that we put out, it's a couple of years ago, but the principles uh, hold true. Um, then there's the idea of a standard, uh, sustainability standard. So you heard about uh, LEAF this morning. Uh, the, the idea is to have something similar for dry labs and computational labs. So the pilot phase is underway, it's going well. Uh, we're hoping to wrap up the pilot soon. But if you're interested and you want to make sure to hear all the news about that, just shoot me an email and, and I'll make sure to include you in the diffusion list. Uh, neuroscience, you'll hear more about uh, that from Nick. Uh, smart scheduling, how to, when to produce, you'll hear more about that from Lincoln in a minute. Uh, but we need, uh, we need to include all that in scientific training. That's quite important to educate. Uh, so we've, uh, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, Amber EBI training team on that. And now in, in Cambridge for the Center of Doctoral Trainings, we try to include at least one session about sustainability in all these programs. Um, but we need more research and that's kind of what's going on and, and you'll hear more about uh, programming opportunities uh, from Lincoln. You heard about rebound effects. I'm not gonna uh, go on that too much, but that's why we need all these changes and all these technical technological solutions are great, but we need for that to go with uh, cultural change. Part of that is building a community like we're trying to do today. So that's absolutely brilliant. Another thing we try to do is to build up a, a community of practice around this topic. So if you're interested at all, uh, we'll put this QR code up in different places. I'll put it back up at the end of the talk. But um, yeah, it's just, for now it's mostly a mailing list, just a Google form to fill to say what you would be interested in. And hopefully this will come together and uh, we can get in, uh, be in touch. Uh, yeah, all the resources are on the website. Um, so if you're interested, uh, feel free to check this out. Uh, including the link to the community of practice and I'll thank a, a million different collaborators. It's been, it's, it's been a really wide effort on that, so that's been great to see. 
Um, and yeah, I'll just finish on that. And if we have some wrap-up questions, thanks. <laughs>